can't wait to dig into it. We're just gonna, let's see, we're, we're, we're starting to fill up, this is good. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, welcome to PMP Live. My name is Brandy and I'm a bookseller with the Children and Teens Department. Thank you for joining us today in this virtual format. Um, I have the pleasure of hosting our event this evening. I'm delighted to welcome our guest, J. Albert Mann, who is in conversation with Mary Quattlebaum to present Jen's newest book, Six. J. Albert Mann is the author of Scar, A Revolutionary War Tale, What Every Girl Should Know, The Degenerates, and Fix, among other books for children and young adults. She has an MFA from Vermont College of Fine Arts in Writing for Children and Young Adults. Mary Quattlebaum is an author of children's books, reviewer for Washington Post, Kids Post, and she's a teacher at Vermont College of Fine Arts MFA program in writing for children and young adults. For today's event, you can ask the author a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you can also vote on your favorite question by clicking the thumbs up button. If you think it's a great question, that'll push it up higher in the queue. Don't forget to have the questions relate to the book author topics we covered today. You can also click on the chat to get your own copy of Fix, as well as other wonderful books by J. Albert Mann. There it is right there. All right. I'm going to turn this over now to Jen and Mary. Randy, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting us. I know Margaret Orto is behind the scenes handling tech and we wanna thank her as well. Um, Jen, it is always a treat to have these Politics and Prose sponsored conversations with you. This is our third one. Our third one. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mary, for doing three of these events with me. And again, thanks to Brandy and to Margaret for hosting us and Politics and Prose. So I am very excited. And you can see I have your um, novel, your new novel in the background, along with your other two novels. And I was hoping we might get a chance to talk about all three of them at some point, because they all do have similar themes. But let's start with Fix. Can you tell us a little bit about the novel and how you came to write it? Sure. So um, Fix is really the story of a friendship between um, two young women who were born with physical difference. Um, so Eve uh, was born with idiopathic scoliosis and Lydia was born with one hand. And it, uh, the novel begins with Eve about to undergo um, a, a surgery to um, correct her scoliosis. And so um, that's where the novel begins. And it's really about the deterioration of their friendship over the course of the novel. So it's told non-linearly and it just goes back and forth, um, back and forth into their friendship and, and what went wrong. Mm -hmm. And Jen, how did you come to have the idea to write this novel? Um, well, it's a pretty personal novel. It's the most personal novel I've written um, to date. Uh, so it's actually the first novel I ever started was Fix. And maybe um, other writers out there feel the same that you, when you begin to write, you really start with your own story a little bit. And even though Fix is not my particular story, it, um, I've, I have gone through the same experience as Eve. So I was born with idiopathic scoliosis. Um, large progressive, as they call it. So I started curving at a really young age mm -hmm. and I curved um, where to a point where they couldn't fix me um, for, many, for many years. Eve gets fixed um, when she's 16, but of course it took uh, medical science until um, I was 36 years old to actually be able to correct mine. So I, I went through the, the same experience as Eve. And I, I kind of, came up with the idea for the story when I was convalescing. So um, going through a spinal surgery is, it's a pretty big surgery. So you're, you know, you're in bed for, you know, almost a year. And um, so you're on, you know, morphine. I was on morphine for almost a year, laying in my, um, in my bed. And um, because I couldn't like walk or do stairs or anything like that at the time, um, the, you know, my family just put me on the first floor of our house in a hospital bed. 
and I was in like the storage room slash slash guest room and next to me sat this telescope and so I was alone a lot with the telescope um, it was just a plastic department store telescope and anyway I befriended it of course when you're on um, opiates uh, lots of things actually come alive and speak to you and so this telescope actually kind of came alive and kind of became my friend we had lengthy conversations and um, that's where the idea for fix comes from because of course Eve is in her bed convalescing and her telescope begins to talk to her and of course it's a little Faustian in that she makes um, a deal with the telescope um, in the story so I never did make a deal with my telescope my telescope was just a, a friendly friendly telescope and and Eve's telescope is a different kind of character altogether with a very distinct personality and um, and I would say a very wily character in many ways so yes, yes. and it's just yeah. interesting to know the genesis of that telescope character in the novel because when I read it I did wonder where did this telescope come from I need to ask Jen about that <laughs> yes I had a lot of um I had a lot of I guess morphine dreams they call them and also when you lay in bed for as long as you do you get what's called um a little bit of delirium because you know everything in your life like there's not much change you know day and night and you know you're just laying there the isolation although everyone in this past year has felt a little bit about you know that delirium and uh, they call it hospital delirium but you can have it when you're just laying in your own bed and um so i had lots of you know drug dreams um you know some were enjoyable some were not um yeah but the yeah. telescope was this telescope was pretty intense yeah and, you know, you, you brought all of that to life so vividly on the page, Jen. I, you know, like sometimes I had to put the novel down because knowing you and knowing that this novel came out of your experience, I, I thought, oh, gosh, this is just so grueling and the pain is so intense for poor Eve and for Jen as well. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah. So as you were... Um, you know, writing this, and, and it's my understanding, you know, you, it was one of the first ideas for children's, a young person's book that you have. So you've been thinking about it for a long time, Jen. So as you've been writing it and doing the research and revising, what were some of your, you know, greatest challenges? And you can talk about that either in terms of, you know, personal or craft or both. So your greatest challenges and also like your greatest sense of accomplishment or joy. I think the greatest challenge was to um, create Eve as a character separate from me. Mm -hmm. um, in the very beginning, uh, you know, I knew the story I wanted to tell and Eve's story is not mine. Um, the telescope definitely shared and the surgery and the pain of that surgery and is something we shared, but beyond that, um, the rest is Eve. And so in the very beginning, I really struggled with that. And um, one of the people who helped me a lot was one of my advisors at Vermont College for Fine Arts, and that was Amanda Jenkins. And she wrote, she really taught me this um, thing she called emotional bursts. And so to get into your character, she would, um, and the way she described an emotional burst was she would make you look at a piece of art and then she would zero in on that art to just a small piece to show some like intense moment in that art. And one of the best things she showed me was like, a, it was a statue of a man and woman kind of entwined. And you would look at that statue and you would see, you know, you'd see um, a statue of two people entwined. Were they in love? Were they, you know, was this their first meeting? But then she would zero in and you saw the man's hand kind of digging into the skin of a woman. Mm -hmm. And so this is how she described her emotional burst. And she wanted you to do that with your characters and to go deeper, to look very closely at them. And so she would have you do these emotional bursts. And I practiced with Eve so much and also with Lydia and to, to get inside of them and to, just to make Eve Eve and not me. And that was any way like you could do it with prose where you would just sit there and just write about Eve and like pick a moment of Eve, like Eve thinking about, you know, um, you know, thinking about her body 
and then just go ahead and write prose, or you could just write words. What would come, what comes to Eve's mind as she thinks about her body? And so these emotional bursts, I practiced them for months um, and to really create Eve as someone separate than me. Well, that is such a wonderful craft tip, Jen. Thank you. I'm going to keep that in mind for myself too. <laughs> um, well, you are a disability activist, um, and we all know these days about how important it is uh, to have representation and inclusivity in books for young people, just how important it is that kids see themselves on the page. So, Jen, what's your, um, what do you notice going on in the industry today around disabled young characters in children's book? Like, do you see an increase in the number of protagonists or even primary secondary characters? Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what you notice. I, I, I definitely see an increase in disabled characters and disabled main characters. Um, I know that the C CBC put out their 2019 numbers. Um, so it was pretty low, it was like 3.5. And of course, if you look at like the CDC's number for how many um, disabled Americans exist in our entire country, it's like 26%. So disability is not a, a, a small experience. A mm -hmm. um, lot of people experience disability. Um, so maybe that 3.5% in kid lit is a little bit small. Um, I know that from the disability community in kid lit that sometimes we feel a little like the stepchild of um, diversity. Um, when it comes to diversity, it's, you know, we're, we may not be anyone's first thought um, when it comes to uh, disability um, or when it comes to, mar you know, books about marginalized folks. But at the same time, I, I think that um, when we look at the own voices movement, when it comes to disability, I see a huge change because this book was the first book I started. That doesn't mean it's the first book I finished, but it's definitely the first book I started. And when we, when my agent first put it out there, it, um, it wasn't, it didn't sell. And um, one of the biggest um, reasons it didn't sell, but we got back from editors was, you know, sick lit needs to be more Access, accessible and that this book number one was called sick lit you know which was which is a, just an awful term and number two to say that it wasn't accessible it wasn't like accessible to, to um able-bodied uh, people. And so it can kind of get you a little fussy because you think oh man like the world is not accessible to disabled folks um but that doesn't seem to be a problem but when you write a story that's very real and true about a disability experience and then it, it being rejected because it, it's not accessible to able-bodied people. That was, it was very painful to hear. But of course that has, has changed. And right now I, I definitely see disabled authors getting published and, you know, and their stories being, you know, just very real because of course their own voices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think of things like right now it's May is um, mental health, right? And so if you look at mental health and, and you look at, you know, um, neurodiversity in those stories, and I really believe that say 10 years ago, you looked at those stories in disability and they were almost used as plot points, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, like in multiple personalities, like people really have multiple personalities. These aren't these aren't novel plot points. These are, this is somebody's life. And so, but that was used as like a plot point. Mm -hmm. And even when I look at like Eve, both Eve and Lydia, my characters are physically different or, you know, a medical term actually in my medical papers, it would say I was deformed. So if you looked um, at like what characters were deformed, if you, you know, you look at Wonder or even A Fault in Our Stars, and these are older books now and, you would see them both, of course, starring um, boys or uh, young men as the ones who, like August is the one without the leg, not, um, you know, um, all of a sudden I forgot her name. Ugh. I did, I, you know what, I forget it too, but we know who you're talking about. <laughs> uh, something grace oh gosh somebody will have to put it into comments for us like hazel grace yeah all of a sudden i forgot her name so hazel grace so she's not the one without the leg and so i feel like as women you know it was it was like you wonder why would why wasn't augie a girl or why wasn't hazel grace the one without the leg 
And of course, it's because women's bodies um, have so much more attached to them than just our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, and I see that changing too, um, wonderfully. I see that changing. That, that is so exciting. And I know that you do a lot of work for the We Need Diverse Books organi organization, which has done so much to just bring awareness to mm -hmm. this need for greater representation and inclu inclusivity across, you know, all identifying markers. Um, but especially, I think there's just been a real blooming of books with disabled characters. It's been exciting to see. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, since we're talking about um, the, this blooming of, of books, could you give us two or three titles of, of middle grade or YA? Like we all have fix on the top of our list now, <laughs> but can you give us another like two or three? Yes. I mean, I like, I don't come to anything uh, with you, Mary, without lots and lots of notes, you know, because um, that's just what we do, you and I, we have our notes. So, and, and anyone out there who's ever studied with Mary knows that uh, you don't come to anything without notes. So, oh, absolutely. So for, um, I'm just gonna name a few and I'm gonna stick to, um, just cause there's so many great books out there, but I'm gonna stick to um, characters who are physically, physically disabled um, or, I, or physically different. So for a picture book, What Happened to You by James Catchpole, which uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about a little boy um, with one leg. And it's just, a, it's a beautiful story. And it just tells the story of anyone who's been born physically different. You know, just that um, people just really feel like they can come up to you and ask you what's wrong with you. And, um, or, you know, just stare, um, to maybe trying to figure it out. People are always trying to figure out like what was wrong. Um, and so I think it's a really wonderful, um, it's a wonderful story. Um, so I won't give anything away there. Um, and then uh, for the middle grade, What Stars Are Made Of by Sarah Allen. And Libby is the, the main character there. And she has a Turner syndrome. And I loved this book because it, it gave a little piece of, um, you know, it, it, the disability story that we don't always talk about, which is economic, and um, what it you know when you have um, when you have you know um, medical needs, this can really be painful for your family. And I know for me, it was a part of my um, my disability experience. It's like you know when you're laying in bed for a year, you know what you're not doing is working, um, and you're also not making dinner or watching the kids. And so there's a lot of guilt that comes with that. You know, not um, being a part of the family or not contributing and things like that. So I I feel like um, what stars are made of really took that on, and it's uh, you know it's a really big piece of the disability story, and then. For why I'm going to talk about Sick Kids in Love by Hannah Moskowitz and, um, you know, Isabel and Sasha. And of course, it's a love story and I love love stories. Um, so that's just, it's phenomenal. And um, Isabel has rheumatoid arthritis. So she uh, definitely looks and feel, you know, looks different than other folks. And um, I, you know, I just, and then uh, he has um, Gaucher's, uh, which is a genetic disorder. So, and I, I just thought that was, not only was it just a sweet love story, but it was actually quite fun. And that's another thing is that the disabled experience, you know, can be just a part, it's a part of our lives. It's not the entire thing. So, and I know that Fix takes on a lot of pain. And so um, I love that Sick Kids in Love, it does take on some pain, but it also takes on some laughs. Yeah, and, and what you're pointing out too by mentioning those different titles is just the variety and the nuance of characterization and types of disabilities and, and just, um, you know, what's going on in these different characters, different worlds too. Yes. Is yeah, I have a whole, I have like, I have like a whole list of them more, but I'm going to stop there. <laughs> We could talk for another hour. <laughs> well, you know what? If you go to like We Need Diverse Books and Book Riot, I'll mm -hmm. give them both shout outs because they do lots of great. So anybody looking for um, own voice disability, like um, both those sites always put up fantastic lists of books. So Yeah, that's great. That's great, Jen. And um, when we move to chat or whatever uh, or to Q&A, 
I'll put in the names of those organizations. And if you have time, if, if you don't mind putting in just the titles of the books and then oh, sure. people can have them, that would be mm -hmm. great. Wow, so many questions. <laughs> um, well, I know you love doing research and your other two YA novels, you know, you did so much research for them. And Eve's story, of course, is different from yours and her relationship with her medication is different from yours. And she's just a different character, different, you know, experience. So what kind of research did you do, Jen? And um, could you let us know, like what was a detail or a fact that you discovered that was most surprising or interesting or? Well, the most, I mean, I did do a lot of research because I love it. And, um, but the, the, most, the, the most interesting, but it's not surprising, it was really my research into women and pain and um, just how women's pain is not taken very seriously. And um, just such interesting things that there was a study done on you know women coming into ERs, you know, and men and women coming into ERs, and you know asking for pain medication, and that, or saying they were in pain. And so often men were given pain medication, but women were given sedatives. Mm -hmm. And so like that's such a telling thing. And like you would think, oh, okay, that that study was probably done in you know 1950, whatever. That was study was done in 2019. So, um, you know, in 2019, women are, are co coming into ERs and saying, I'm in pain. And, you know, they're like, you know, not only are they almost saying, calm down, they're giving, they're giving them sedatives. And of course, sedatives, yes, they do help to calm you down, but they, they don't relieve your pain. You know, you might care about it a little less, but, you know, but men on the other hand, and when uh, I looked at another study and it was saying that, you know, uh, men are more stoic and women complain more. And so that's why women often don't get, you know, they don't get treated with pain medication because it's assumed that women are complaining where men who are much more stoic and don't complain as much as women, if they're saying they're in pain, they're taken much more seriously. So um, yeah, so things still need to change in the, the healthcare industry, yeah. you know? And of course, if we, go, if we can go deeper into that, because it's not just women, but if you go ahead and talk about um, the, you know, black women's experience, like it's even worse mm -hmm. um, that their, their pain is not taken even, even less seriously. Um, and there's been some really, you know, horrendous outcomes because of that that black women are saying, you know, something's wrong or something, you know, and they're not taken seriously and, you know, not good things have happened. So, so, de so definitely. Jen, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, I think there was a little glitch or something, um, but I was just going to say that's so disturbing. Um, the results of that research and that these studies were done so recently. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, uh, yeah, if anyone loves to do research, you know, I always talk about Google Scholar. So all you do is put in Google Scholar and then you go, you know, of course you just go, go wild. Like it's, it's, uh, it's such a wonderful database and, you know, you can look up so many different great things. It's such a great beginning, mm -hmm. you know, because then you can go, of course go into their, the bibliographies of these um, scholarly uh, papers and, you know, start digging. Oh, so. thank you. So we got a yeah. good research tip uh, from you just now. And then we also have the emotional bursts craft tip. And so, you know, thinking yeah. of craft, um, you did such a wonderful job with the kind of um, mixed form of fix. Like it's partially written in free verse poems and partially sort of like in a first person prose narrative. And of course, you know, as you said before, the book moves back and forth between sort of like reflections on the past and then the present moment of an ongoing story. So Jen, wow, how, how did you manage that? Like, what was your thinking behind doing it in that way? And what were some, you know, craft challenges that you might've bumped up against? 
I mean, I love nonlinear storytelling because I, f I feel as though um, we live in an, like, I know we live in a chronological, we live in time order, but I, I feel like we feel in, in, in nonlinear order. And so, um, and we also grow nonlinear. We don't just grow like this. It's just not on this upward, you know, it's all over the place. And so it felt, um, it feels more real to me to tell a story in, um, you know, out of linear order. So I, I knew I was always gonna tell Eve's story in that way. I did start the whole story, I wrote the whole story in prose first. And I think what ended up happening was um, when I was taking on, so I did, um, the present story is all done in um, prose and then the past is done in verse. And as Eve becomes um, more and more addicted to painkillers, um, to the opiates, uh, you know, it kind of starts to like, she starts to actually think even in and tell her story in verse as things become more confused to her. What's reality? What is the past? What is the present? Um, so it does like the verse actually sneaks in there along with the prose. Um, and I, I took on, when I was reading the past, there was a few different reasons I went to verse. You know, the first was pain. Like I felt that, you know, the pain was so hard to write. And that like, in other words, if somebody's screaming in pain, if somebody's just screaming in the very beginning, you can get very upset with this screaming person, like, and like somebody do something. But if they keep screaming and screaming, you can actually get pretty like, okay, you know, shut up now, no one can think, you know? And um, I, I feel as though the person who's in pain screaming, well, the pain is the same and that's why they're screaming the same. But I just don't think readers can handle that. And so I needed to, I needed to um, kind of like, you know, you know, pare down Eve's pain a little bit, like kind of get straight to it mm -hmm. and not surround it with so much. Um, because it did feel a little like Eve was just screaming and screaming. So I think that was um, one of the first reasons why I thought, okay, I need to, um, I need to take this down a notch. Um, and, and verse does that. And then I think another reason that verse really worked was um, the altered mental state. I really struggled with writing an altered mental state because a true altered mental state is, you know, almost unreadable. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't re truly read um, a, a real altered mental state. And so to try to put that altered mental state into um, prose, um, it felt again, like kind of overwhelming and heavy. And so I needed to hollow out um, that. And, you know, and then I think the third reason I did it was because um, as addiction to kind of takes over and as drugs kind of takes over and, you know, you, you, you fall further into this altered mental state. Um, there's, there's something about a uh, verse that, ab that, you know, kind of gave that feel of, um, you know, you know, just unreality, you know, the loosening of reality mm -hmm. that I really liked. So, um, yeah, I, I have to say I love, I loved verse, you know, I loved like zero extra words, you just get to it. Yeah, you do. And, and that is just such a wonderful way of putting it too, when you're talking about the form that Eve felt hollowed out with her yeah. pain and through her experience and the verse form sort of mirrors that condition as well. Yeah. Mm. And as I read, you know, your the free verse poems, they did really punch you. I mean, they impacted you just at a very visceral level where prose with, you know, the sort of linear noun, verb, noun, periods, compass sort of experience of, of reading, you don't have that same sort of like emotional visceral impact. Yeah, it's almost like the more words you have, the cushier your fall. Yeah. Uh, but the less words you have, like that kind of the pokier, the pointier they are, and they kind of stick at you a little more. And um, yeah, and then also that white space that surrounds those words. I, I felt like Eve was experiencing, you know, if anyone out there has experienced it, it's the isolation that comes from just, mm -hmm. you know, lying there, you know, in your bed. And 
you know, and it's not even it, with um, spinal surgery, it's not even that I was lying there, but I was lying there like, you know, someone had literally stuck two giant poles up you. So you're like a scarecrow, you know, you're lying there like, you know, just stiff, you can't move. Um, so, and you know, of course, after they have done all of that, you know, stuck giant metal poles inside of you, you're also wrapped in, you know, thick plastic, uh, you know, brace from, I know it's wrapped from my clavicle to my hips. So um, you also have that experience as well. So yeah, you're just kind of stuck there. And I, I feel like that white space um, for me also represented the feeling of, you know, nothingness that isolation gives you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that this will always be my yes. the sort of floating in this whiteness, this emptiness. yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, except for your evil telescope who sits next to you and whispers. <laughs> <in your> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I was so curious about the name Eve because I, I hope I'm not giving too much away here, but there is like a little snake that creeps into your novel, um, a metaphorical snake. Um, but so is there any significance to the name Eve? Like, was this a name your character always had or did you think through, you know? I definitely, the name was always, you know, I was thinking of, you know, I was thinking of Eve's, um, you know, the, the first woman. And um, I also felt like her mother as an academic um, and a feminist um, would have like, because because Eve has no fa father that, you know, it was an, um, a sperm donor. And so I, I feel like it was like Adam's rib that she, that Eve just comes about, you know? And then also there is that, um, that, you know, the pain that um, I guess God gives, you know, when, mm -hmm. when Eve eats that apple and God gives her more pain, you know, um, in childbirth and so definitely it was a choice and her name was always Eve. Oh that's yeah. so interesting. I'm so glad you unpacked that for us <laughs> and, and, and especially the pain aspect you know because of course that's a big part of the Genesis story is that you know because of what happened they get ousted and experience pain. Yeah yeah the childbirth like just like the punishment yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Man doesn't, man doesn't get any horrible pain to deal with. Yeah. But, but we're going to give him a lot more drugs if he ever has pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> hurry, hurry. <laughs> um, well, I wanted, you know, to, to give us both a chance to touch on your other two novels too, because as I read Fix, I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this is such a gen man book because I see those themes writ large in all your recent work, Jen. Um, you know, and, and so much of your um, other two novels, uh, What Every Girl Should Know and The Degenerates explored some of the same or explored the same themes, you know, just the agency that women don't have over their mental and physical conditions over their own bodies. But also, you know, these themes of coming into a sense of one's power as a mm -hmm. woman or as a girl, and also how important female friendships are. Like Lydia's and Eve's is like paramount for both of them, even though, you know, it's going wrong. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, all three of those novels and sort of those similar themes. Yeah, I, I love those themes. I think they're really important themes. They're really important themes for, um, I feel like young women to, to hear and read. I often see the, you know, the, you know female empowerment and also um, friendship, but these seem like they, they get, um, you know, put into like middle grade more than they do into mm -hmm. YA. And so I really love to talk about them in YA because I think they're such important themes. I mean, I when I look at Margaret Sanger's life, you know, what every girl should know, and um, she would have been, she would have, you know, not changed the world if it weren't for her sisters. So her sisters literally work as maids so they can put her through school. Mm -hmm. And so um, there would have been no Margaret Sanger and therefore, possibly no birth control for a lengthy amount of time, you know, if her sisters hadn't supported her. And so I just, I, I just feel like it's, you know, 
it's such a powerful thought, you know, that these friendships, and of course, siblings can also be friends. Um, and then with the degenerates, I see London, if, and if you haven't read it, uh, our audience hasn't read it, it's about the institutionalization of um, girls and women um, with disabilities during the eugenics movement. And uh, men, of course, were also, but they were separated inside of the institution. So this is a, about a group of young women. And, you know, London is the one who, um, she comes in uh, and, and she's the one who gets them out. Um, but and it, so it seems like London would be the most powerful of them all, but London really needs, you know, Maxine and Rose and Alice and even Thelma uh, Duma to um, actually learn who she is and to love herself, London. So she couldn't do it without. So yes, maybe they wouldn't get out without London, but London, you know, wouldn't understand who she was without those other, um, without those women in her life. So um, it's such a great theme. And I, I, um, I, I think it sticks with me if I look back at like film, I remember, and I'm going to date myself here, but watching Thelma and Louise for the first time. And I think of all the buddy films and buddy uh, uh, books that are out there for men. And then here came Thelma and Louise. And it was like the first time I ever saw two women on the screen in this tremendous friendship. I mean, of course it had to do with rape because that is so often a woman's story, but it's not her only story. But of course that was, you know, at the time that was the story, um, but it was so, it really affected me, um, that mm -hmm. story. And so I love to dig in and, and find stories like that where, you know, women need each other, women help each other. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jen, we're getting close to the time for Q and A. So I just wanted to ask you, so what's next for you? Do you you know, what have you been, you've been working on during the pandemic and, and do you have any new books coming out? And because, you know, Eve has such a distinct voice and perspective, I was wondering if you could read a little bit um, from Fix so we could just get a sense of her voice in our ear before we move to Q&A. Oh, sure, so um, let me do that. Uh, what's coming next for me is, um, I am actually working on glorious nonfiction. So I'm actually working on my first, uh, my first work of nonfiction. So it's gonna take on, um, I'm working on it with a co-author, a childhood friend of mine, uh, Saladin Ambar, and it's about civil disobedience. So it's the history of civil disobedience in America. So we're gonna take on all those great American lawbreakers and we're doing it all in verse because wow. it's, you know, um, you know, because we're going to get right to it. So also I've, I've fallen in love with verse. So, all right. So I'll read, I'll, I'll just read the first chapter. Um, it's a quick one. Uh, and I just think it's always good to start if, if the audience hasn't read the book. So, um, so it's called uh, and, uh, Fix is first chapter 19 degrees. So I'm cold, cold and confused. Do I feel the tube between my lips, the staples sunk deep into my torso, the bars and screws bolted to my spine, the pain? No, all I feel is cold. A warm shadow lingers over me. I hear her, maybe, then nothing. I dream of soft blurry voices and distant bright lights. Slowly, so slowly, I realize these aren't dreams at all, but reality flittering into focus. Colors, sounds, everything hazy and high-pitched and filled with beeping and clicking in the whooshing sounds of air. At some point, they pull the tube from my throat. I think about screaming, but then forget. Nearby, I hear someone calling out over and over. I beg them to please stop, although only in my head, because my voice is off somewhere, lost. I see the light of day coming in through a window, and I hear Dr. Sawa talking, laughing. Where is my mother? Eve, someone calls to me from a distance as if I'm floating far away from them. Hey, lazy, open up those eyes. You can totally hear me. It's Dr. Sawa, his missing H so familiar. He always joked that he left that letter back in Ghana when he came over at 18. I think I must have smiled because he chuckles. Dr. Sawa is always chuckling. That's right, I know you're there. Am I? 
or am I on a river sliding along in the sunshine, safe, warm, happy, until he leans over me, blocking out the sun like a rain cloud. Eve, I'm delighted to report that you are officially 19 degrees. 19 degrees. It's easy to hear his pride in that number, 19, but I can't wrap my head around it, this new cob angle measuring the tilty twist of my spine. Large progressive scoliosis meant my forever collapsing spine was forever producing a new one. 48 degrees, 52, 67, who could keep track? Although this one, 19, is now fixed to me by titanium. The river spins me, then stops flowing with a loud snap, sending a searing shudder all along that 19 degree angle. The beginning of the second week in Massachusetts General Hospital is filled with pain, needles, thirst, and screaming, mostly mine. I am pinned under cold, wet skin and bones. I can't breathe from the terrifying pain, the fear that this bloodied slab is forever on me, in me, is me. Then there is the shuffle near my IV, the surge of air deeply entering my lungs and me grasping at the nearest scrubs to let them know they saved me. They have to keep saving me before I'm floating off again on that river, light as a duck feather. Sometimes I wake up screaming in the light. Sometimes I wake up screaming in the dark. Every time I open my eyes and even when I don't, I scramble for the button to my morphine pump and cry out to Martin, the nice nurse, regardless if it's his shift. And there he is, bending over my arm with an extra dose, a rush of saliva, a sting, and I hear her again. Martin, I whisper, she's here, Lydia. It's the drugs, baby, Martin tells me. No one's here. Wow, Jen, wow. Congratulations on another, you know, important, beautifully written novel. Thank you. Thank you, me. Mary. And thanks for chatting. Sure. Oh, always a treat. Well, let's see. Let's go to Q&A now. And I see, oh, Jen, you have so many friends that are so eager to ask you questions. So the first one is from Emily Burak, and she says, um, congratulations on this new novel. Um, did you find revisiting your own life experience cathartic, painful, or a little of both? Definitely a little of both. Um, it, was, uh, it was really great to delve back into it and um, to kind of, you know, relive it in a way that where I wasn't in horrifying pain, so I could look back at it and, you know, think about the experience outside of that. Um, but it was also uh, a little terrifying too when I think about what I went through. Um, it was such a, a huge, uh, you know, something so huge to take on. There was, of course, the, you know, the, the fear of surgery, which for me, I had a 5% chance of death and I had a 15% chance of total paralyzation. And um, so those numbers were really scary going in. Um, but at the same time, I will say, Emily, one great thing about lying on your back for a year was um, all the reading I did get to do. So uh, I do love that. I read some, I just, books were all over the place and I would just like reach around and pick one up and just start reading. It was, it was, and there was no guilt. You know, how sometimes you can feel guilty when you're reading and the sun goes down and you're like, wow, I'm still reading and you turn on that light <laughs> and you know, you know, you've been reading all day and there's this guilt. Well, there was no guilt. So that was nice. <laughs> So here's a question from Melissa C from this Disabled Kidlet Writers. Um, and she says, her question is, how do you see the landscape of disability in Kidlet changing over the next few years? So we talked, you and I talked a little bit about changes we're seeing in the moment. So what, what do you see for the near future, Jen? Um, well, I, in the near future, I see some phenom phenomenal works coming out um, from you know, terrific disabled authors. And I'm going to put that list up when we're done. So, I mean, I created a, I, a, an entire list of great books that are out there right now. And then some books that are coming out in the, in the rest of 2021 and into 2022. So I, I definitely see so many own voices where we're really going to get to live um, different, um, 
you know, different disabled lives. And I, I think that that's a, it's a wonderful thing because it'll only grow us, you know, grow our empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now we have a question from Liz Garten Scanlon. Oh, <laughs> who says, how did the personal aspect of this novel make writing this book different from you emotionally, psychologically, and personally than your other books? You know, you know, try again, when I talked about Eve and how, you know, Eve is Eve and I'm not Eve, I, I, I really spent a long time trying to get Eve to be Eve and not to be me. And I, I think, um, and maybe uh, to the other disabled folks writing, you know, stories that are similar to their own. I mean, one of the things that you uh, have to do is it just takes longer. It really does take longer when it's got a lot of you in it. And it's also a little scary um, because it's one thing if people don't like, you know, my character from The Degenerates London, or if they don't like Margaret Sanger, you know, those people aren't me. Um, and even though Eve's not me, I'm so close to her that if they don't like Fix, I think that's that's very scary. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's maybe a little more a little more scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna. You have so many questions, Jen. I'm gonna, and, and we have limited time, so I'm gonna skip around a bit. Um, this is from Shelley Nospish, who says, "Have you connected with any teen readers who received an arc?" And how did they respond to the story? That's such a good question. I mean, mostly it's Goodreads, uh, Shelley. That's what I would say. It's mostly Goodreads. And, um, you know, they they seem to be connecting to the story. Um, if, if, they, if Little Brown did give it to teens as opposed to adult readers, um, truthfully, I'm not really sure. But I will say that, that um, they should be giving it, um, books more to teens um, than they probably do. Yes, and you know this is this is a story that you just feel would so deeply connect with young people who are experiencing something similar, whether the addiction to painkillers or the actual, you know, similar surgery. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I see a question from your editor. Oh no, she says no question. This is Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> But no she question. said, congratulations. Um, let's see. So uh, just I don't know if everybody knows, but my editor also uh, has uh, was born with uh, idiopathic scoliosis. And so Lisa and I both went through at what's called the double fusion. And um, so it's pretty amazing that when she got my book, she was like, oh, my gosh, like, um, and the double fusion is not something that a lot of, um, it's just not a very common surgery. Uh, so a double fusion just means they have to open you up from the front and also open you up from the back in the same surgery, which is really complex. Um, and they, ha you know, you have to have special equipment like a toaster bed that kind of squishes you and flips you during the surgery. And it's very long. It's like an 11, 12 hour surgery. So it, that, that my own editor also went through this. So it was like what I was writing and she was editing. So it's like, was Lisa's experience, my experience, and then Eve's experience. And then to top it all off, of course, we, when we were having lunch that first time talking um, about the book and we've discovered that we actually shared the same surgeon. So, which was, which I know it sounds so amazing, but because um, not many surgeons do this kind of surgery, it actually, I mean, even though it was shocking, um, you know, not a lot of uh, surge, you know, orthopedic surgeons did the double fusion um, or do double fusions. So it's, it's, uh, but it still was pretty cool. Yes, yes. And, you know, to be able to work with somebody that knew at such a deep level what your character was dealing with. That must have been phenomenal too. Um, if everybody hasn't seen it, there's a wonderful um, conversation between Jen and her editor, Lisa, in Publishers Weekly, is it Inside or, I, I read it online. Yeah, I think it's uh, the children's uh, you know, bookshelf or whatever, okay. so the, uh, yeah. But people could probably Google it if they were interested in reading it. it was, that was just so fascinating to read. Um, okay, and here is a um, question from our friend Suma. And she says, that was such a powerful reading, Jen. Um, could you share your revision experience with this story? 
that was a question I had too, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. I, you know, when it comes to revision, I actually, on Goodreads, I put up um, I put up my revision process, Suma. So if anyone wants to see what I did, I actually laid it out um, in, on Goodreads in my blog uh, because it was, it was an intense experience how many times I went back into this book uh, to, to revise. And, um, and then also to where, you know, moving around because it was nonlinear to moving around the different pieces back and forth to where it felt very natural to swing from chapter to chapter. I think the hardest part about revision was as I moved these like chess pieces of stories around, you know, to make them feel um, right, to connecting them and how they would naturally flow from this experience to this experience to this, even though we were going back and forth in time. I think that was one of my hardest um one of the hardest pieces of revision was the, you know, kind of building that connective tissue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Carolyn Tara O'Neill has a question. What made you finally decide to write Fix after sitting on it for so long? I think maybe I was ready. Sometimes you start out with a book and um, it's a big book. It's a personal book. Some writers call it, their, you know, the book of their heart. And um, I think sometimes trying to take that on, it's a lot of times the first story that comes to us. So it's the first story we begin, um, but we need a little more practice, a little more time, a little more distance, um, a little more education. And I think for me, that's what happened with Fix. I just, I needed more time with it. I needed to have more experience um, before I took on a character who was so similar to myself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, you were working with craft at such a, a high level too, Jen. Like I can imagine that with other books that you've written, you've sort of built up your skill set so that you could tackle, you know, what was a, a very complex craft sort of. Um, no, it, it definitely did come out that way. Like I, I took on, like it was first person and then the, the past tense, um, the past tense actually toggles um, it's in verse, but it toggles between um, first person and second person. Um, and I don't know if it's noticeable in the story, but I take on the actual, like the memories that she, that Eve is um, kind of sugarcoating a little bit are in, um, are in verse uh, past tense. And then the, but the memories that uh, are, that she's, that are actually becoming what's, that are real, the real memories. And those I do in second person. Um, and I, I, I actually chose that so that they were a little more in your face and a little, like a, just a little different. And I don't know if people will notice it, but I hope they, even if they don't notice that this is in second person, I hope they feel differently when they read them. Yes. Um, and just wanted to thank um, SK Tate, who in the Q&A has a link for the uh, conversation between Jen and her editor, Lisa, oh. that we just mentioned. So thank, thank you. you. And um, Brandy will be coming on soon, but we'll just have one more quick question from Ginger Park, who says, of all your heroines, which one is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> We yeah. all love and dread that question, huh? <laughs> yes, I mean, I, you know what? I'm going to have to say London from The Degenerates and mostly because she's nothing like me at all. Like London is like quick-witted and um, just strong and in your face and decisive. And, you know, she's going to, she's just going to do first and whatever happens, happens. And I just, I just, I love her. I, I aspire to be London. And so definitely I'm picking her. Yes. She was so scrappy. She was always yes. ready to have a physical fight too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she was like, I feel like at any moment she was ready to jump out a window, like <laughs> just to jump, you know? <laughs> oh, so Jen, this has been such a treat to chat with you. I, we're running out of time and I know Brandy's going to join us again to just kind of close out the evening, but just wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank our audience and you know thank them for their attentiveness and all their wonderful questions too. I wish we could have gotten to all the questions even. <laughs>
Yes, and, and I know, hi, Brandy, I can see you there. Um, <laughs> but before you do, uh, Mary, I just want to thank you. And also, I would love to just ask you one question, because so often we do this, and uh, one of these dates, we're going to have the tables turned. Um, but can you tell the audience, because everyone loves Mary Quattabam, what are you working on? Wow, what am I working on? Um, well, I'm working on several picture books, because, you know, I, I just love me some picture books. Um, and... You know, it's the, the pandemic has been an interesting experience. And I, like so many writers, I had so many scraps of this and that and this and that. And they might not even be things that are publishable, but I just felt this kind of yearning to return to them. And I would put them on my list, you know, for years and not quite get to all of them. And the, you know, the COVID experience was a terrible experience for the entire world. Um, and, and yet, you know, it afforded many of us a little time. And I felt like I, I loved having that time to actually just burrow into projects and spend several hours a day on them if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So nothing in particular that you want to give a shout out. No, no animal story coming our way soon. <laughs> I am working on some animal stories, yes, okay. yes, but I won't give them away at this point in time. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Sorry, <laughs> had to unmute myself. Thank you so much. It was such a great conversation tonight, and uh, I feel like we could have just kept talking. And also, viewers, thank you for those great questions. I, there were so many more that we could have answered. Uh, what a great program. So thank you both so much. Um, you can always click on the link. It just popped up again uh, to purchase your copy of Fix and other books by J. Albert Mann. Um, uh, feel free also to come into our store. We've, we've got lots of copies as well. Uh, you can learn about other upcoming events in the children and teens department on our website, politics-pros.com. Just click on the children and teens tab and click events for a calendar of upcoming events. And you can also view our past events on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Mary. Thank it's been a great program. Much. And politics and pros. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. All right. Have Thanks a good night, everybody. Coming.